My name is Raymond Barnes. Every one of my brothers' name began with an R and last name with I mean, that's, I mean, every one of my children's name began with R and ends with B. I mean, we were R and B, straight R and B. I mean, if you play the Spinners or OJs or Jeffrey Osborne or something, man, I, I mean, there's probably nothing they did I don't know. I took pictures with these guys. I went to all the concerts. I mean, it was straight R&B. I was really R&B fan. At the end of the shop goes way back to like the 1950s, and my dad started. Um, he started in the retail business, retailing music. He started out with the just music store. Other shops used to come to him, and they used to ask him, "Well, can you sell me some things? Can you sell me some things?" So when I came back to work in the business. We were actually wholesale, and although we did have two retail retail locations, it was it's like a full-blown conclusion that I would come back and work in the store afterwards. So, um, 1980, I began working in the store. That that's what we did. We bought from major record companies or smaller record companies, and we sold to even smaller stores. Uh, 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 I would get all these DJs to come in, and I kind of noticed that. You know, they, they kind of they kind of were gravitating to the house stuff, you know, at the time. I mean, to be honest, the DJ International tracks, they were going crazy for this stuff. That's when I, I became good friends with the Wayne's. And um, that's when we I, I decided to start a record label, and he, he decided to do the first record for us. My first Dwayne record was a cut called The Browns. Uh, that uh, I put out uh, with Jesse Saunders. And uh, I used the label Dance Mania uh, to put that song out. Well, I met Ray because at the time, um, you know, we had a, and I say we as in Jesse and myself, Vince, we all had a record label. And uh, Sky Vince was, set, was selling records to Ray, you know, at Barney's One Stop. And I would take the records over there and collect money and everything. And me and Ray just started, you know, coming real cool. I used to always have long hair. And Ray called me New Wave. So he just would make, call me names, <laughs> you know. And he still does that to this day. You know, like he was buying records, buying records and selling for uh, like Larry Sherman and Rocky, all those guys, you know, they would take their records to Ray and Ray would, you know, distribute them, you know, because they were buying them. So Ray was like, you know, he wanted to get into the game. And we talked about it. And I had wrote uh, this cut hardcore jazz. And I told him, I was like, hey, I've got a song, you know, and I played it for him. And so we put that out. And then I I just took Dance Mania, the, that name, with me. And that's how I started, you know. When we decided to do a record label, we threw names around. He said, well, why don't you just take the name, you know, the, uh, the name Dance Mania? It started to take off. It really surprised me. I would say after we put it out, within three to four months, it was making noise. They were playing in the clubs. Uh, but what really shocked us was that uh, what was happening overseas. That blew me away that you know, I could go in some of the record stores over there and it was in their bins and people were buying it. I was sign, put it like this, I was signing on Geffen Records and I was making more money with Ray. Our publishing arrangement was good, it was fair. You know, so both of us made money. You know, it was, it was just fair all the way around. You know, and even times with, when, uh, I never took an advance from Ray. We just put it out. As I recall back, man, it was no problem finding artists for me. I mean, I had people coming to me. I had five, ten people coming to me daily with uh, with tracks to release on the label. So it was no problem finding artists. I, I mean, that was the least of my concerns. A lot of the guys that came through the record label, they also worked in the store. You know, Byron Singley um, worked in the store. 
Jam and Gerald worked in the store. Corky. Yeah, Corky worked in the store. Traxman. Yeah, uh, Traxman. I wasn't really concerned about ripping people off, making all the money, making all the profits, or something. Cause it was, it was like, it wasn't even, a, it wasn't even the majority of what I was doing. It wasn't the main thing of what I was doing. It was a part of what I was doing. And so I think that contributed to it. And secondly, I mean, I ain't going away to college and everything. I had a degree, and I wasn't, I wasn't insecure about people rising up with me. We were friends. Out of three house music labels in Chicago, I, I honestly think, I mean, if you had to rank them one, two, and three, Dance Mania probably would have been third. Uh, I, I don't think as far as creativity it was third, but I think as far as commercial success, it was probably third. We weren't getting a lot of airplay or anything like that. We weren't getting a lot of mix play or anything like that. And I know the records we did were real good at part. So eventually, it was like, well, we're not going to get here for anyway. I mean, we're, we're already third, you know, so, you know, let's just do what if we want to do, you know. Hit it from the back, hit it from the back, hit it from the back, hit it from the back. If you really think back. about it, and you can say it, but I was back. talking to Marshall Jefferson the other day, and me and Tyree were talking about Marshall, Tyree Cooper was talking about Marshall, and we were saying, man, if you take Video Clash, raised the BPM like about six or seven. It's a ghetto house track. Um, and really, there's nothing, in my opinion, there's nothing new about the actual style of it as far as maybe BPM and maybe some explicit lyrical contents and different things like that. And, it, and it's, it's a lot harder. That's it, you know. But for the most part, I think what it is is that it's like with everything else, you know, things and styles kind of, um, evolve into different things. Most of the music that was being created was really being created in the ghetto. It's not like a facade. Like all of us living together. <laughs> I remember Andy at Gramophone. I remember specifically, he was giving me an order, 12 inches, he wanted, they wanted for the store. He said, okay, let's go to the ghetto stuff now. I'm like, man, all this is house music. What, what do you mean, let's go to the ghetto stuff now? You know, he, he had a list of ghetto stuff he wanted. And 99% of them was Dan or Dan Smithians. I would give Farley the credit as far as like being the godfather of Ghetto House for the simple fact, you know, Farley was making house records, you know what I mean? But he also had this record called S -S 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 You know, that was like more so, if you listen to that record, that, that record actually can be credited as far as like, because no one else did it, did that type of music. I would say Farley, then me, myself, which nobody knew about, but Jam and Gerald and Funk, Funk had tracks early on. He had a track that was real popular. I don't know if Funk produced it by itself. It might have been Funk, Gerald, House, maybe even House Mon or something like that. But um, it was like, a, a, you must be Bart Simpson. Dun, 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 it was cheesy, but it was, you know. I really, really just recently realized how big this was overseas. I, I mean, I, I mean, everything's, you know, you have the internet now, you got social media, you know, everything's every the world's a lot closer now. I think I think if this was like twenty years after or something, I would have known immediately. I really didn't know. I mean to be honest with you, I didn't know. We didn't do this for any kind of commercial success. We didn't do it to try to um, well this is the formula to follow and we can sell more records. I mean everything was underground. Everything was underground and everything was people doing, you know, how the music naturally progressed and people were doing what they felt. And we felt good about the music. Everybody felt good about the, what they were doing. And we knew it was good music, but I didn't know it had reached that level of acceptability that it had. I was just trying to think of some things to do at the time, and I, a good friend of mine named Derek Pittman, his name is Shines, we call him Shines. Yeah. And um, we used to work together on Home and Ogden. Well, he knew a guy named Waxmaster, 
and he was like, hey man, you need to hear this track called Ghetto Shout Out. I mean, it wasn't called Ghetto Shout Out then, it was called Project Shout Out. He said, you need to hear this this thing on Wax Master Mixtape called Project Shout Out. During the production of, uh, of that record, a friend of mine, Terrence, Terrence Robinson, he had a Casio drum machine, I had a Casio, I used the Casio drum machine on the whole EP. It type of, because that, you know, nobody was using it. It's just strange that nobody was using it. It was a great drum box for like housework. His friend of mine named Dave Ross, like he checked his drum box out. But for the most part, I was using MPC. Uh, MPC. I think Wax Max came in with a sample, uh, with a sample, and he came in with an emulator or SP1200. Ghetto Shout Out was a track that I did um, when I was living in the projects with my mother in my little bedroom, you know what I mean? I was like, you know what? I was like, let me say something about all the projects and all the clubs in Chicago. And so I did it. I would love to let you all hear the very first one that I did. You know what I mean? I, I, I'll let you all hear that too. It was real cheesy. It was basically like a... It was so cheesy, but they loved it. When I say people in the city grabbed to it, I think the CD, well, all, just about all the CDs that I that I release as far as like doing my my ghetto mixtapes no less than ten thousand a cup easy. When I did the ghetto shout out, we went and re recorded it. I went and re recorded it okay. at Tracks Record, you know, with um with Victor, you know, and then that's how it ended up being released on his record. It's sort of like him bringing me out, you know what I mean? So we, so we re released it, you know, put the vocals on there, and that's the link between me and him. Basically, in the, the Ghetto Shout Out record, I'm talking about, you know, projects, you know, different projects and different. And then I also had a, like I said, I had a mixtape where I gave DJs all their props. And I called it The Godfathers. So I like, get them their props, you know, Sluggo, Southside, Southside, Wax Master, Westside, Westside, um, you know, um, Dion, Southside. So I basically, I gave all the DJs their props. And that and Ghetto Shout Out is just like the same thing, called out the different projects and all that. So... I think Thomas, when he li Thomas and Guy, when they listened to that, they did a song on the homework album called Teachers. That's Thomas and them sent me and um, Paris Mitchell that plaque this year, 2013. You think they did it because they wanted to have some good press about their new album coming out? What you think? <sighs> so many people have remixed the record. You know, I actually did a so much that came from that record. Um, I actually did a remix for a group out of Australia called Soft Tigers. Another, the ice cream one. Exactly. That's a good and they was like, dope, and they was like, could you please give us something that's like the ghetto shout out? We talking about ice creams, but could you say something about the different ice creams? So it was funny though. I'm like Boysenberry. They had some. Bo I never heard of Boysenberry ice cream, but Boysenberry in this one, chocolate in this one, whatever. Check this out. What's your favorite Boysenberry? That's your favorite flavor. Hell yeah. Irish coffee. That's your favorite flavor. Hell yeah. What about that chocolate? When I closed the label for about three or four years, I would notice we would never get new clients. It would always be the same clients. So, you know, the natural progression is that, you know, you're going to lose a few clients, you're going to gain a few in a year, you lose a few next year, you'll gain a few. Then, for about a four or five year period, I only lost clients, I only lost stores that I could sell to. There were no new stores, and I, I could kind of see the writing on the wall that, you know, this is not good. You know, we, we, we it's a smaller and smaller base to sell to. Eventually, we just had to close down. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have enough business to stay in the business. Victor would call me about once a month. Uh, doing the label. Let's do the label. Let's do it. Come on, man. We got to do it. Man, you. Man, he used to say, man, you're a living legend. And I, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, sure. yeah, sure. And, <laughs> man, no, he, he admit, I, he used to call me sometime. I would, I pull into the gas station. I'll be like, Victor, hold on a second. Get out, go pump my gas, and everything. And I'll come back to the, oh, you still here? <laughs> Man, I, I don't know why he kept doing it because I, I used to put him off so much that um, 
I mean, I don't know if I would have been persistent with somebody as he was persistent with me. Then I just kept getting calls about the label, about records. Um, a couple of people offered to buy the record label for me, and I'm like, I don't have anything to sell. You know, uh, you know because when I would give people's desk back, I would give them back to them. I, I mean, it, it's like, this is your music. You know, this is not my music, this is yours. You know, I, I never had a beef with anybody about, well, you're trying to take my music. Uh, you know, I, I would gladly give people the music back. You know, when I when I when I get a box of dad tapes from the guy I messed with, well, this is yours. So you know, I would call the guys up and you know, come get your music.